And now on BBC One, in place of the advertised programme, The Pace Setters, we join the Tomorrow's World Team for the return of the Space Shuttle. Five, four, we've gone for main engine start. We have... They're on their way back, but they're not home yet. This is Mission Control, and we're waiting now for confirmation that Columbia carrying astronauts Young and Crippen has gone into the eeriest part of her mission, the radio blackout. This is caused by the intense heat from growing air resistance as she re-enters the Earth's atmosphere. Let's listen to the uh, live sound coming from Mission Control to confirm that this important stage has been reached. One can only conclude that NASA are filling, and I as yet have no confirmation that radio blackout has been reached. When it takes place, I have confirmation that it has taken place. Columbia has silently slipped into that eerie stage in the mission, and we will all wait for some 15 minutes, which is obviously why uh, NASA are, uh, are filling with their commentary for the end of that blackout and news that all is well with the returning spacecraft. Columbia in blackout on her way back to Earth. So it looks as though Young and Crippen are on their way back. 35 minutes or so ago, Houston confirmed the flight crew had turned the orbiter around using those tiny thruster rockets so that she was orbiting backwards. Then the orbital maneuvering system, the two small rockets at the tail of the spacecraft, were fired for the last time on this mission to slow the spacecraft down, allowing gravity to draw her towards the Earth. Right now she's on her final flight path, which will take her over Guam, over the Central Pacific and Wake Island, heading for a landfall some 25 minutes or so from now, here in the Californian desert at the Dryden Flight Research Center alongside Edwards Air Force Base. And Kieran Prenderville will be reporting to us from there in just a few minutes. Now this is a most disconcerting part of the mission because as Columbia entered the atmosphere at 25 times the speed of sound, the intense heat caused by the growing air resistance cast an electromagnetic shield around the spacecraft and it is this which cuts off all radio contact. For 14 minutes or so, Houston and the rest of us will have no idea what is happening to Columbia as she falls back to Earth at over 100 feet per second, glowing red hot. Now, assuming all is going well, and I'm being assured by NASA that there's no reason why it shouldn't, within 23 minutes now, she'll be on the ground at Edwards in California. Waiting there is Kieran Prenderville. What's the mood in California, Kieran? Well, it may sound a bit fanciful to talk about how you can feel tension, but out here right now, you almost can. Because very shortly, the heat shield tiles get a chance to do their stuff. We're told that they're still all on, but even if they are, will they really work? And even if they do, can Columbia really plummet from 150 miles up down to a safe landing on a dried-up lake bed without any engines? But well, we're all keeping our fingers crossed out here because the astronauts only have one chance and one chance alone to get this right without any power. And everyone knows it. We'll be back to you soon. Right. Indeed you will. This really is the nastiest moment of the mission, because as well as radio silence, the heat created by re-entry puts a tremendous strain on Columbia's thermal protection system, the now famous tiles. Two years ago, NASA realized it had a problem with the 30,000 or so silica tiles. Tests indicated that under the stress of liftoff, some of these tiles, vital to the orbiter if she's to prove herself as a reusable spacecraft, would simply not remain stuck to the spacecraft's aluminium fuselage. Pull tests were carried out on the crucial ones, those that failed were strengthened with a special silica slurry and were rebonded. This time, NASA said the tiles would work, would stand the stress of re-entry. Well, the ability of this material to resist the transfer of heat is amazing. 
I could continue holding one side of this section of the silica material, even if the other side was glowing red hot. But it is very fragile stuff. Watch how it crumbles under the influence of just my fingers. Quite apart from not bonding, it comes away very easily. Hardly surprising that some have doubted whether it's strong enough to do its vital job. Then, midway through Sunday afternoon, came the pictures no one wanted to see. This was Columbia's first television transmission from space, and it showed that some tiles were missing. A shock wave on liftoff had dislodged some of the tiles from the engine cowling on the side of the fuselage. And off the port pod, uh, looks like I see one the full... Now this is the section of the spacecraft with the missing tiles. Not a make or break area by any means. But what the television camera couldn't show was whether any more tiles in the vital area of the spacecraft's underside had been damaged. This is the area where the brunt of re-entry heat is being taken right now. Geoffrey Pardo, it is quite a battering the thermal protection system takes. It's having a rough ride at the moment. Not only is the temperature very high, nearly 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit at this critical part of the nose here, very high temperatures right the way down the leading edge, particularly out here into where the vortices are. Also, heavy suction trying to pull off the tiles from here and behind here. Also, very high temperatures, 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit at the front here. Now, the problem is this. If this thermal shield is intact, they don't feel the temperature inside. If it is not intact, and particularly missing from this area, they're already beginning to get dangerously hot inside. Jeffrey, thank you. At Mission Control, and let's see if we can pick up some pictures from America at this time, they, like us, have no means of knowing how Columbia is standing up to her severest test. Stress on the heat shield is now at its most critical, and she is, of course, still in radio silence. Give me a test count, please, the FRC. All they can do is practice talking with one another on the ground. They can't contact the spacecraft. I keep saying that this is Columbia's severest test, but it doesn't end with the heat and the radio silence. When she emerges from this ordeal in some 10 minutes or so time, she'll still be at 100,000 feet, 535 miles from Dryden, and travelling at 12 times the speed of sound. But though man has never been through a shuttle re-entry before, a test orbiter has been flown in the atmosphere. A report from Judith Han. Four years ago, they took an experimental shuttle and rehearsed landing here at Dryden. The point of the test was to make sure the spacecraft actually could glide to a runway and wouldn't get out of control. Somewhat incongruously, a red carpet and reception was laid out in the desert. And it wasn't for the test pilots, but for a rather special visitor, Prince Charles. They watched from the side of the runway while the test shuttle was carried on top of the jumbo to over 20,000 feet. To explain the procedure to Prince Charles, astronaut Joe Engel showed him the flight plans. Joe had successfully flown the test shuttle only two weeks before. Uh, the shuttle was... Sitting in the cockpit of the shuttle, he explains how the craft separates from the jumbo. ...sufficient to give it some angle of attack so that at the condition when the 747 pushed over and increased its airspeed to 230 knots, the orbiter was in fact trying to fly off the top at that time and being held on by three bolts, three explosive bolts. So when the conditions were right, the bolts blew and it actually flew right off the top. Now, of course, we didn't have any power. We were a glider and not a very good glider at that. The lack of engine power means the pilots have got to get it right first time. Whether released from the back of a jumbo, as in this test, or coming in from space, there is never a second chance. They're hurtling in faster than any commercial airliner and approaching the runway at a much steeper angle. It glides badly, and with its tiles and tendency to plummet, it's been described as the flying brickyard. For even the very best pilots, it's certainly a challenge to glide it into safety. I think the vehicle is exciting to fly. I don't think it'll ever become a bore to learn to fly the shuttle. It's a demanding airplane to learn to fly, and it requires a great deal of aggressiveness to keep ahead of the airplane. So I don't think that you'll ever want to put a pilot in the airplane who does not think and is not capable of acting and performing aggressively and with very short notice. 